You're listening to Beyond Wellness Radio, bringing you the cutting edge in health, biohacking, and sports performance. Stay up to date and listen anywhere and anytime on your computer, tablet, or smartphone by subscribing on iTunes. Catch your host, Dr. Justin Marcajani, as he answers your burning health questions as well as interviews from world-renowned guest experts. For more Beyond Wellness Radio, go to beyondwellnessradio.com. Hey there, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani. Welcome to Beyond Wellness Radio. Feel free and head over to beyondwellnessradio.com where you can access our full podcast transcriptions. While you're there, you can also sign up for our thyroid and female hormone video series. This series goes into the root cause of why your hormones are out of balance. While you're there, you can also schedule a functional medicine consult with Dr. Justin, myself, where we'll dig deeper into the root cause of your health challenges. Feel free and think of sharing this podcast with at least one person. This podcast grows by people sharing it. Sharing is caring. If you can think of one person that can benefit from this information, please feel free and share it. If you're enjoying the podcast, make sure you subscribe on iTunes. You can also click below the video or podcast where you'll see the iTunes review button and leave us a review. You can also sign up for the newsletter at beyondwellnessradio.com where you'll get updates before anyone else. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. Evan Brand, it's Dr. J. What's going on today? Hey, not too much. It's Friday. Feeling good. Ready to rock this house. That's excellent. Today I'm actually drinking my uh, drinking apple cider vinegar right now. Bragg's has these new little apple cider vinegar drinks. It's um, This one's called Ginger Spice. I love ginger. Lots of great anti-inflammatory and uh, lymphatic and anticoagulant benefits. This has zero calories and it's sweetened with a little bit of stevia and it's a little bit of organic ginger and then it's just basically distilled water with organic apple cider vinegar. So I've had that one. It's good. Yeah, I love it because apple cider vinegar is basically acetic acid and most people are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're, you're drinking acid? Isn't that going to make you more acidic? Well, the whole acid alkaline thing, I've kind of debunked it in many different talks, but most people with stress actually get more alkaline, right? And the problem is most people whose intestinal tracts are alkaline or guts are alkaline, especially the stomach, they're going to have protein issues. They're going to have maldigestion. If a urinary tract is too alkaline, you're going to get a yeast infection or a UTI or a E. coli, you know, BV infection. So apple cider vinegar has so many great benefits and it just shows you Taking in some apple cider vinegar helps with digestion. It also helps mobilize calcium and minerals as well. So lots of good benefits. Most of your acidity issues are going to come from inflammation, typically from extra refined sugar and infections and stress. Yeah, I'll never forget when I worked third shift in college. I had a the building or general man. Oh, I just realized that I had muted my microphone. Yes. So, so, so you, were, you were saying that. Let's go back. So let's pretend we'll cut this part out here. So you were saying third shift when you were in college or when you were working? Yeah, when I was working third shift in college, this guy, he was a general manager, some type of big wig. He always looked so good where other third shift people look like vampires. And I asked him, like, what is your secret? How do you look so good? And he says, I take a shot of apple cider vinegar every day. And he was doing the brags. And so that's what kind of turned me on to it. I was like, man, this guy looks so much better than everyone, all the other vampires working this shift. And so that was my, my entry into apple cider vinegar. And if you go on earthclinic.com, they have a lot of like natural remedies and stuff there. Apple cider vinegar is literally at the top of the chart for everything. I'm talking digestive issues, food poisoning, skin issues. Like it's incredible. I mean, that, that is a, a true super nutrient. Yeah, it's phenomenal just for the fact that it will help your digestion. When you get stressed, digestion goes south, which means, well, you're not going to be able to break down protein as optimal. If you're not making enough acid, well, you're also going to have um, an ability to kind of like sterilize your gut. So infections that come in are definitely going to be a problem. Apple cider vinegar has been shown to help with blood sugar and blood sugar stability, which is awesome. They did a study where um, it re reduced blood sugar by 34% when eating white bread. Right? Not that I'd ever recommend that, but it has a beneficial effect on that. Uh, great disinfectant, can help with weight loss, and I think a lot of it has to do with the pH and with um, 
digestion and potentially helping with minerals. Like if you get a little eye twitching, a lot of times that's from calcium. And if you take that, you can help mobilize that calcium so it can get to where it needs to get. Because a lot of times if you are under stress, your body will pee out alkaline minerals when you have excessive cortisol. And taking in the apple cider vinegar will help mobilize those minerals so you can hold on to them better. That's very cool. So you're saying you're going to be dumping magnesium from the stress and therefore the kidney magnesium balance is offset? And potassium as well. And that, that's Guyton's physiology. That's in the textbook. Yep. High secretions of cortisol and stress hormone will cause you to dump alkaline minerals. It's like so, jet fuel. Yeah. So on that standpoint, how would your pH look in, on a urine strip if you're dumping a whole bunch of alkaline minerals? May yeah, not look well. that bad, right? Mm-hmm. May not look that bad. And also, go out and do some sprints and then check your pH. Do you think it'll be more alkaline or more acidic? I'd say more alkaline if you're stressing the body with that high intensity. Actually, if you do exercise like that, you are going to be creating lactic acid, right? And that, that will shift your pH more acidic. So now, would we say that go out and doing some HIIT training, high intensity interval training, would that be good or bad for the body based on what we know? I don't recommend it <laughs> Well, if we, that often. Well, if you're doing it right, there's lots of great benefits for interval training. Lots of great benefits. You know, if you're keeping it within 10 to 20 minutes, it's there's phenomenal benefits with growth hormone and everything. So that would be a beneficial thing. So just because you're creating some acidity from that exercise in the form of lactic acid, that's not a problem. But if we just base everything off the pH alone, and that's our only filter for saying something's good or bad, you'd have to say exercise in that form is bad, but it's not. We know it's not bad, right? Maybe if you're doing too much of the CrossFits and too many AMRAPs, right, as many reps as possible for 20 or 30 minutes and not resting and not having that interval downtime, that may be a problem, especially if you're adrenally stressed. That's what I was going to say. I'm just biased because 9 out of 10 people I'm working with are so adrenally fatigued anyway that they can hardly get to the gym and let alone do 15 minutes on a treadmill walking, you know. Right. So it would have to be something that energizes you. So Kind of keep that in mind. We went on a little tangent with the apple cider vinegar, but I think it's a worthwhile topic. Yeah, definitely. So we wanted to talk about just fatigue a little bit, just in the context where fatigue comes from and simple things we can do to help fix it. You want to start us off, Evan? So the first thing for me is going to be light exposure, bright light exposure, because mm -hmm. a lot of people that we're working with, they're working inside of an office environment. So typically they're going from their house, which is a box, to their car, which is another box, to their parking lot or their parking garage, which is a box, and then the office box. They've never got exposed to that bright light. And we know cortisol is driven by light. Even, even these people are throwing on sunglasses all the time, maybe because they have adrenal issues. So they're always wearing sunglasses to, to try to cope with the bright light because they can't handle it. But if you're never getting exposed to that bright LUX, that measurement of brightness, like 100,000 lux that you'll get on the sunny day versus 500 lux that you'll get in an office, you're, you're going to be tired just like that, no matter if you're having a good diet or not. So that's why people will go to the caffeine because they never got that cortisol bump from the bright light. So now they're seeking a stimulus to try to artificially boost the cortisol up. Yeah, exactly. So I'm a big fan of like getting up and I'll have my, my butter coffee and MCT out in the sunlight. Like this morning, I do wear a little bit of sunglasses though in the morning, not because of, we got a lot of bright light here in Austin, but because I do have some kind of like little bit of specks on the side of my um, sclera in the eye and I just want to mitigate sun damage. So I wear, I do wear sunglasses out in the sun, especially at the lower latitude here in Texas, but I do get out in the sun. I expose my skin and my face first thing in the morning because it really gets that HPA access kind of dialed in. Right, So I do cold showers in the morning, at least end my five-minute shower with the last minute being cold, and then I do have a little bit of coffee with butter and MCT, and then I get that sunlight, that bright light exposure to get my HPA access woken up saying, hey, this is time to get things moving and be productive. Yeah, that is one thing I miss about Austin, the abundant sunshine there. Exactly. And today, just on the fatigue perspective... I don't think we need to go too much into detail on the adrenals and thyroid component because we've already done many, many podcasts on this. So off the bat, the adrenals and thyroid and mitochondria are all going to have to be ruled out as a potential driving factor of the fatigue. So we're kind of looking at strategies outside, just looking at the adrenals, the thyroid, and the mitochondria, the, the three amigos, as I call it, for energy. Those are the three amigos. 
Yep. So outside of that, sunlight's really important. I'm a big fan of blood sugar stability, and that kind of falls in the camp of the adrenals and thyroid because it's going to help that, right? Everything's going to help all of these three body systems. But getting um, good blood sugar stability, meaning eating that breakfast in that first 30 minutes to an hour of getting up is going to be a really important one to stabilize the blood sugar. The more you're under stress, the more your body's going to need minerals like magnesium and zinc and B vitamins for energy. So doesn't make too much sense to skip breakfast and skip meals, especially when you are stressed because, well, where's your body going to mobilize those things from? It's going to have to mobilize them from tissue or it's going to have to mobilize um, them from, you know, your mineral, your mineral stores in your body and it's going to put stress on your body and it'll cause more cortisol because your body's going to have to mobilize it somewhere and cortisol is that catabolic hormone. It's going to break things down in your body in particular amino acids to help um, give you energy and convert it over to glucose and sugar. Yeah, I figured we could talk about the immune system too, just because a lot of people that are under stress, they have some baseline level of stress, we all do. The immune system can get taxed, and I know you, you and I, I think we've probably done a whole episode on additional mushrooms, but supporting the immune system is something that's really helped me. So I've been doing a lot of astragalus lately, just... Uh, a daily dose of it, and I've significantly improved my energy levels. And I was reading a book the other day about herbs, just herbs and herbal medicine. It was talking about how astragalus can help to boost your cold tolerance as well. And so I really haven't been that cold, even though I've been out in the snow and hiking and ice and freezing temperatures. The astragalus has boosted me up. So some good baseline immune support may be helpful for the fatigue picture too. And we talked about cordyceps before, but I'm sure there's other, there's other herbs and stuff like that and mushrooms that are helpful. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, astragalus is great for helping the spleen. It's a good blood filter and it also increases your body's TH1 immune response. So talk, really we, we talk about that for a minute, like the TH1, TH2, that's something that I'm not an expert in. Yeah, so your TH1 is going to be kind of your, it's called the cytotoxic immune response. It's like the um, the special forces of your immune system. So it's like the Navy SEALs or the, the Delta Force or the Army Rangers, so to speak, the people that are in, in the, um, I should say, where all the action is up front, right? So that's like your CD8, those are like your natural killer cells. That's the TH1 branch. They're in there up front, getting in off the bat. And then we have kind of the infantry that may lag behind and keeping the analogy of our immune system, that would be the TH2 immune system. So these could be like our helper cells, our CD4 helper cells. These could be the various antibodies that are made like IgA, um, IgM, IgG is a little bit more delayed. These are um, immune antibodies that then come later after the fact like the infantry. So you want a good, strong immune system, the TH1 immune system, and then it takes about a week for the TH2 guys to come out. Now, people talk about vaccines for immunity, but vaccines really only touch the TH2, and even that's debatable with some people because you can have an antibody, and that antibody may not be a good antibody to actually fight and then kill an invader. It could be a weak antibody. So vaccines only touch the TH2 or the humoral immune system. They don't do anything to work on the TH1, the cytotoxic, natural killer-based CD8 immune system, and that's so important. So you'll hear about people with an imbalance of TH1 and TH2, which I guess this is another tangent, but are people – more dominant with that TH2 typically because they're lacking that TH1. They're lacking that good immune response out of the gate, the frontline NK killer cells and stuff like that. Or is it, are you able to, to say the majority yeah. of people are X or Y? Yeah. There's some theories out there that some people are more TH1 dominant over TH2 dominant. Uh, people that are more sensitive to, to coffee and caffeine, that's a TH2 type of stimulant. So if you are TH2 dominant already, imagine a seesaw, right? As TH2 goes up, TH1 goes down. Let's say you have caffeine and that stimulates your TH2 more and you feel worse. Well, that may be a sign that you're TH2. Again, there are certain interleukins that you can measure on a blood test. Interleukin 1, 2, uh, 6, 12, TNF, alpha, and they kind of – they correspond with each side of the immune system. I don't know the exact breakdown uh, off the bat of which ones go to which side, but on the markers, you can look at it, and you can do a CD8 to CD4 test, and you can see kind of 
what's what's higher or lower. Now, ideally, we want a CD8 that's about twice as high as a CD4, right? Want more, twice as much natural killers, twice as much natural killers as we do um, helper cells. We want a good, strong TH1 defense. Some people are, are more imbalanced on one side or the other. Now, when we look at that, it's going to be like your medicinal mushrooms. It's going to be like your astragalus, your echinacea, a lot of your immune-boosting herbs, elderberry, um, golden seal, all your medicinal mushrooms, uh, shiitake, chaga, cordyceps, um, reishi. These are going to be like your TH1 stimulants, and then all of your antioxidants, and things like caffeine, green tea, EGCGs, epigallocatechins, resveratrol, pignogenol, grape seed, your OPCs, your um, oligoproanthocyanidins, say that 10 times fast. These are all going to be your antioxidants that drive TH2 stimulation. So you need both. You need both, yeah. But again, I'm a big fan. If you get sick, though, stimulate the TH1s. Yeah. Again, but be be wary if you notice if you push one side or the other and you really don't feel good, it could be that you're dominant on one side or the other. For me, I don't really get caught up in that because I call that like window dressing. Because if you have an infection or you have blood sugar issues or you have a lot of gut problems, that's gonna screw up your immune system already. Now, does it matter, you know, what what direction it's screwed up in? Well, let's just fix why it's screwed up. Let's fix the stressors. Let's fix the infection. And then we can have um, a better immune system that's balanced. Makes Simple sense. things like vitamin D and glutathione will balance out the immune system in either direction, whether you're TH2 or TH1. Vitamin D and um, glutathione will help with your T regulatory cells and help balance it out either way. So those are things that you can't go wrong with is the vitamin D and the glutathione. Cool. We'll have to rename this to the immunity show. I know. We'll have to kind of have like your fatigue and immune system connection show. I mean, this we're off the cuff here. We're going pretty spontaneous, and we extrapolate all the information based off what we've seen and what we've uh, experienced with our patients in the clinic. Yeah. Immune health is just a big one because you hear so many people, and they will talk about the fatigue as maybe like a main symptom, right, or their depression or sometimes – you know, we'll have people come in with anxiety issues that happen with the gut. And then they talk about, well, I have the year round sniffles. And so that's kind of why I wanted to bring up the immunity piece is because it's like people don't really understand what to do about it. So they'll go and they'll take the day quill or the uh, what else can we talk about? The conventional antihistamines, the Claritin and all of that. But they're never really getting to the root cause. But immunity still on the forefront. And I went to the gym the other day and I saw three different TVs with three different drug commercials, all for immune-based issues. Like it was like Claritin and Nasonex or something and something else. And you're never going to hear, hey, why don't you just fix your your gut or your thyroid or your adrenals, right? It's like, let's just, let's just shove something up your nose and fix this immune response, which is just crazy. Yeah. And then also um, people don't really talk about the HPA access, but that's the the hypothalamus and the pituitary, the brain, or I call it the thermostat of the brain or the body, which talks to the adrenals, is really, really important in your immune system. There's one um, article right here from the Journal of Medical Hypotheses, and I'm just going to read the last couple of sentences. It says, further studies of the nature of the beneficial effects of cortisol and possibly other adrenal cortical hormones <clears throat> upon humans are needed. And it says there's recent evidence of the feedback relationship between the immune system and the HPA axis. And with the increasing awareness, not only that the immune process provides protection against infection, but also that you know it, it may get impaired with excessive cortisol stimulation or a drop in cortisol, super low cortisol. So one of the major reasons or one of the major signs of good cortisol HPA axis function is a nice cortisol rhythm. On a twenty or a you know a six a.m. to ten p.m. to twelve p.m. twelve a.m. test that good I should say maybe a seventeen to eighteen hour test we have a nice cortisol rhythm and that's going to be really really important for HPA axis feedback and starting your day off with a cool shower and that light stimulation can be very helpful at setting the bar for that HPA axis and then stabilizing blood sugar in the morning that's going to help as well so if we have good energy and good adrenal function, we're also going to have good immune function and good HPA access function too. Right. It, when you see the people on the commercials, it's not normal. They show the lady walking her dog through the park and she's just sneezing and it has like this orange 
glow to the commercial and then she takes this drug and it's like oh everything's green and i'm not allergic to the environment it's like allergies are not a normal thing to me maybe you have a different opinion but to me i don't think people should be as hypersensitive to the environment and react to everything like a lot of people do people just talk about it like it's no big deal oh i'm allergic to this i'm allergic to that i'm allergic to grass i'm allergic to cats to dogs it's like mm, maybe but i've seen improvements and I'm sure you have too. With when you support these other systems, the immune response kind of turns off a little bit. Absolutely. And if you have chronic allergy issues, it typically means a TH2 immune system type of response. It's your TH2 system is just so hyper responsive where you're developing antibodies and allergies to just dander in the environment, cedar or various things in the environment. And that's not healthy either. Now, I almost find that allergies can be a really big sign of low stomach acid, right? It can also be a big sign of adrenal dysfunction. Because if you look at a lot of the common allergy medication, like what is it? Well, a lot of them are going to be corticosteroid based, right? Or they'll be like histamine based. They'll be like histamine degranulators like Benadryl, or whatever other histamine drugs that are out there, or they're gonna be corticosteroid based, Zyrtec, or like an inhaler, or albuterol. I mean, they have like 100 different names. It's impossible to know, know them all, but they're all corticosteroid based. And if you continue to take a whole bunch of synthetic cortisol, well, that can actually weaken your immune system too. That makes sense. Do you get cedar fever, or are you tough enough to beat it? I've No, I have zero seasonal allergies. Absolutely See zero. I mean, it's it's amazing when, when I was down there in Austin, how many people were like, oh, God, here it comes, the cedar fever. And, and I was fine. And I just thought that was crazy how many people talked about it, like it was an epidemic virus that was going to spread throughout the city. Yeah, I never had any issue. I, I still don't. I mean, I have no problem with it. And you can see it. It really lays out in the cars pretty well, a pretty th thick bit of uh, pollen there. But if you have good adrenal function, if you have good stomach acid levels, and let's say, you know, and also good detoxification system too, because good detox means good glutathione. Glutathione, like I said, affects your immune system, right? It's a good balancer of your immune system. Outside of that, let's say you did have allergies. Well, what would you do? I mean, if you look at a lot of the really good allergy products, um, N-acetylcysteine is a big compound in a lot of these products. What does that affect? Well, that's going to affect glutathione. Uh, what else is in there? Well, bromelain. Bromelain is a really good enzyme that will help with the immune response. Also, you'll see things like stinging nettle, which is a natural antihistamine. You'll see things like vitamin C, which is a really good uh, anti-allergy one. And you'll even see things like quercetin. And right, quercetin also is a big converter over to glutathione as well. So when you look at a lot of these things on the herb side, you have things that are going to help with histamine, they're going to help with your immune system, and they're going to help with glutathione, which are all super, super great for helping to actually support your immune system versus just I don't know, like if you had a house that was on fire and someone kept on lighting the fire and you just came over there and put the fire out, but then as soon as you turned around and they lit it again, would that be good? No, you'd want to get that person out of there, stop lighting the thing on fire. <laughs> and that's kind of how I see cortisol as like the synthetic cortisol. It may be helpful in the moment and be palliative, but long term, it's just totally ignoring the underlying cause of why your immune system's there. And not to mention, all of these things are going to affect fatigue because the reason why you're having these issues is because your body's not able to deal with inflammation to begin with. And what's the main system of dealing with inflammation in the body? It's going to be your adrenals. Yep. Great way to tie that back into to that fatigue picture. Yeah. So kind of we're going to just keep this podcast on the immune fatigue connection here just so we keep a good linear thread. So also when it comes to the fatigue and energy system, if we have poor digestion, we're going to have poor bacterial balance. And one of the big things that bacteria produces is B vitamins, right? B vitamins are going to be really, really important with energy. So we want good B vitamins. Like one of the things I'll start seeing when I give specific probiotics back into patients, we'll start to see their urine get a touch more yellow sometimes. 
And that's a lot of times they're starting to make some extra B vitamins and they're starting to pee some out, which are fine because if they're peeing some out, that means they're also utilizing some too, right? You don't just pee them all out. Your body's going to pull some of those in and maybe push some out. So that's okay because it means that the other parts are getting some. So we'll see some yellow tinge to the urine happening, which is a really good sign because we're getting the gut bacteria to make some more B vitamins and maybe even vitamin K2 as well. That's so cool. Yeah, I completely forgot about that whole aspect is – so the probiotics are going to start producing. They produce B12. That's all in the colon, right? Well, we're going to absorb B12 in the stomach. We're going to bind it to intrinsic factor in the stomach, and then we'll absorb it at the very end of the small intestine called the ileum. So if we have poor stomach health, uh, the same cells that produce intrinsic factor are the parietal cells in the stomach, the same cells that make HCL. So if we have gut stomach issues, we're probably going to have issues absorbing B12 in the stomach binding it to a trendy factor, and then finally absorbing it in the ileum, the end of the small intestine. So what happens in the case of, like my dad, for example, he's had like 18 inches of his colon, his large intestine removed from super bad diverticulitis. Are you, can you ever get back to a normal energy and, and health? Or I mean, are you, without that section, are you unable to manufacture things? Like how does that change the whole process? Well, your colon is going to be like reabsorbing a lot of like electrolytes and minerals. The big place of absorbing nutrients is going to be the small intestine. So that's going to be the big place of absorbing nutrition. But you definitely would want to run some nutrient-based tests like an organic acid test and a spectra cell test just to make sure nutrient levels are dialed in and supplementing them. I mean the people that really have the biggest you know, hurt are the people that get the gastric bypass because their stomach is just – made to be the size of a thumb or a thimble and it's just not a good situation it's i call it um surgical induced anorexia oh my they, god they basically now have to go on like a 500 to 800 calorie diet just because they don't have the structural anatomy to absorb it so basically they're inducing anorexia oh yeah. my god and so typically they do gastric bypass for what just major obesity yeah they're just doing it because they, well, one, they don't have the right strategy on the diet perspective. So they're eating the wrong foods and they're keeping this whole craving thing going and they're just over secreting insulin and eating the wrong foods. And the medical establishment isn't skilled in the nutritional changes that have to be made. So they just throw the only solution it has, which is a surgical intervention. So it's like, all right, here's the food pyramid, which says 60 to 70% carbohydrates, mostly gluten and inflammatory grains, no emphasis on quality or pesticides or chemicals. So once that doesn't work, which most people it doesn't work, then the only other option they have left is a surgical based option, which is, you know, isn't the best, especially when you're just inducing. And I say anorexia, I mean starvation. I consider eating a 600 or 800 or a thousand calorie a day diet. If you're supposed to be eating two, I consider that starvation. Okay. The concentration camp victims, uh, in Auschwitz ate 1200 calories. So if you're inducing starvation beyond that point, right, no one would say, oh, well, yeah, these people at Auschwitz are well-fed. No one would say that. Okay, so you having a gastric bypass procedure and having under 1,000 calories now or let's say 50% below what you'd need, that's starvation. That's not good. And that's why the rates of these people after these procedures, the risk of depression and all these other conditions is sky high because when you decrease surface area – of getting nutrients in your body, now everything you eat has to be incredibly nutrient dense because you just don't have room to avoid bad stuff when there could be good stuff that needs to come in. Wow, so you've taken a cruise ship sized fishing net and now you have just a little handheld fishing net to catch like a goldfish and that's pretty much it. That's it and it's not fixing the underlying issue and I get it, these people are reaching and a lot of it comes from the fact that they're just thinking that their medical doctor just knows it all and that, hey, that dietitian they referred me to, they showed me the food pyramid. If there was something else that was better or different, they would have told me it. So they have this kind of false sense of hope that all their options have been explored because their medical doctor and dietitian would have told them otherwise. So there's this false sense of superiority, and that's where the internet comes in because you've reached 4 million people. I reach hundreds of thousands a month, and people without even seeing us just try it and then write us back, wow, I'm doing so much better. Like we're not even 
working with them directly and we're helping people. But the medical establishment has this false sense of superiority that people are just indoctrinated on from the drug commercials and growing up and the whole idea of doctor's orders and watching all these shows on TV that glorify doctors, thinking that they know everything. And so once you know the diet doesn't work, the next option is going to be this gastric bypass. And at least the newer surgeries like the lap band or the glove around the stomach, it's better because at least they can be reversed. Just having the old-fashioned gastric bypass is, oh, it's really, it's more permanent because they're really cutting that stomach off versus the glove or the um, the band can be can be loosened up later. Talk about fatigue. I guess that's a good way to probably wrap this thing up is just to talk about calorie deficit in general because you oh, mentioned yeah. that. Huge. I mean, you'd be, you'd be crazy to think you could have enough energy after that surgery. And I'll find too that if you look at like someone's food journal, it's kind of hard to get enough calories for certain people depending on their activity level if they have a paleo style diet. Because if you are eating a lot of vegetables and say meat's a little bit more of a, an accessory as, as a main, as opposed to a main thing. And if they're not getting enough fat, maybe they're still a little bit fearful of getting in the, enough butter and coconut oil their calories can be pretty low on a paleo diet. And I think sometimes people are too low, and that's why they're tired as well. A hundred percent, because let's say your diet is 60 to 70% crap, and then you switch over to a paleo style of eating, or paleo template as I like to call it, where now you're eating nutrient-dense, anti-inflammatory, low-toxin food. But let's say 50% of those calories you haven't replaced. Let's say you just Let's say that some of the meat and the fat in your diet you keep over and maybe some of the veggies, but now you're a thousand calories short. Well, you're going to feel fatigue because you're telling your body and you're telling your epigenome, right? This, this is the part of your genome that flips switches, genetic switches on or off that, hey, we got to conserve energy because we are in a famine, right? We're, we're in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, so to speak. We don't have access to nutrition. So let's start shorting some body systems, right? It's like you're in your house and you get a big electric bill and you and your wife say, well, let's just you know, put the AC on this summer instead of 70, let's put it on 78, let's make sure the lights are turned off. You're conserving energy in the house to have a, a, a lower electric bill. Well, the same thing happens in your body. Instead of turning lights on and adjusting temperatures, it adjusts energy, it adjusts brain power, it adjusts sleep and focus, it adjusts respiration and hormones, all of these systems start to become dampened. And then the question you have to say to yourself, well, if you're trying to start conserving on these things, which body systems do you want to start shorting? Do you want to have less um, detox capacity? Do you want to have less hormonal strength? Do you want to have less brain power or neurochemicals? And most people would say, I don't want to short anything. I need it all. So the question is, well, how can we just, instead of, you know, work on decreasing the amount of energy, how can we just increase the amount of nutrition coming in so our energy can be as optimal as possible? And part of that is if we switch from that paleo template, we have to make sure we're also getting enough calories. So the things that I'll do is I'll do a food log with patients or we'll use a MyFitnessPal app and I'll have them plug in all their foods and we'll figure out how many calories they need to just to maintain and if they don't get that amount of calories, we know off the bat there's going to be fatigue and body system shortage just because calories are always going to have nutrition in them if we're eating nutrient-dense foods. If we're eating poor foods, yes, we can get calories with no nutrition. But for just keeping this conversation consistent, all of our calories are going to have nutrition because we have a paleo template. Right. Yeah, and I just came across some research the other day that I was showing to my wife that was looking at women who during pregnancy had calorie deficits. Obviously, the fatigue's going to be greater, but that the baby, or when it grows up to be a child, was actually at a greater risk of obesity because if there was a quote-unquote famine during the pregnancy, that child's going to have to be a little bit more efficient at storing calories. And so there you go. Now, this stuff starts even prenatally, which is kind of crazy. It does. And then the other piece is, okay, let's say you're having enough calories coming in. Well, are you breaking them down? Are you absorbing them, digesting them, and assimilating them? That's the next question. Because if you have, let's say, an infection going on, whether it's a SIBO or H. pylori or a parasitic infection, that could impair absorption because you got critters competing inside your tummy. The next piece is, well, are you super stressed where your hydrochloric acid levels are low because you're in that fight or flight state? And if your hydrochloric acid levels are low, so are your enzyme levels. So you may not be extracting nutrition 
from your calorie from your food because because of that stress response. I see people that you know aren't able to go four to five hours between meals, and they're eating a lot of food, and they're telling me I'm just I'm eating a lot, I'm eating a lot, I can't eat anymore. The next piece would be, well, there could be a malabsorption thing, and we try to fix it by replacing enzymes and acids and bile salts, but the next thing is really getting the infection cleaned out too. We'll see if I have one. My test is done. It'll be shipped next week, so stay tuned for my test results. Do you have one on hand that you can run? I want to see what yours says too. Yeah, I got two tests I'll be running side by side any day now, so I will, I will, keep, uh, I will um, keep you plugged in on what's happening. Okay, cool. And I know you'll be waiting on, on bated breath. Yep. So just to kind of recap here, uh, we talked about HPA access for fatigue. We kind of connected fatigue to the immune system because cortisol helps with energy and also is important in the immune response. Too high, that can suppress the immune system. Too low, it can um, it can decrease energy as well. And if we go too high on the allergy meds that can suppress our immune system because cortisol or synthetic cortisol derivatives can have an effect on our immune system. Next, we talked about healthy gut bacteria and B vitamins, how crucial they are to energy, especially B6 is so important for the brain function. It helps really kind of escort and bring in a lot of the amino acids for the brain. So we need a lot of B6 and then obviously our B1, our uh, thymine, our B2 riboflavin and B3 uh, niacin. These are all really important for energy, healthy gut bacteria. We talked about how malabsorption and some of these surgeries and such, the the gastric band or bypass can decrease surface area. We talked about transitioning to paleo and how people go low calorie naturally, which can affect nutrition and energy. And then we also talked about we also talked about last but not least was making sure we get enough uh, absorption, avoiding dysbiosis and infections and low stomach acid, making sure we have the absorption piece to the gut dialed in because we could be eating enough but not absorbing enough. Yep. Anything absolutely. else you want to touch upon? That's it. I would tell people if you like this show, share it with people. Review the show on iTunes. Share it with one friend. Even if you are applying everything, there's, what, 350 other million people in the United States and – another seven plus billion in the world that we need to help get this information before the American medical establishment uh, takes over the rest of the world and, and indoctrinates them with that mainstream attitude. There is another way. There is another solution. So that's what we hope to provide here and hope you enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. And I want to just touch one thing. Be a fa All great points, Evan. Really, really good points. Last piece, though, is be a fat burner. Most people are sugar burners, okay? meaning they have excessive carbohydrate in their diet and they are relying more on sugar for fuel. Okay, Relying on sugar for fuel is like going to a campsite, needing to have a fire to cook and provide warmth, and having to put twigs and paper in that fire. Well, if you do that, you're going to have to be putting twigs and paper in that fire all night long, every few minutes to keep the fire going. That's what people that do too much carbohydrate – and eating too much carbs are like. They have it to constantly feed it. If you put a log in that fire, that fire will sit for hours on end. And the logs are akin to healthy proteins and fats and vegetables where the refined sugar or the higher carbohydrate is equal to the twigs and the paper. And the hot, ref, really refined sugar and the alcohol is akin to the gasoline. So if you try to have a fire going with gasoline and twigs and paper, it will be a very long night for you. <laughs> if yes. you're using the logs and the proteins and fats, it'll be an easier night. And depending on how much logs and how much protein and fat and how much uh, paper or kindling and carbs can be adjusted for each person. So don't freak out. There's there's a, there's a ways to customize and make it specific to each person, but we want to push people into being more fat burners versus sugar burners. Now, whatever level that may be, are you a Jimmy Moore where you got to be at 20 grams of carbohydrate a day, or can you be somewhere 50, 70, 80, 120? That's going to be up for you, the individual, with your doctor or nutritionist to find what works best for you. Yep. And it may change based on your stress levels and based on what's happening in your life and how much exercise you're doing. So, again, this isn't a one size fits all. We're really customizing it and we're providing you that clinical functional medicine eye that we use every day with our patients. 
Yep, I know we're way over time here. So lastly, go to our websites, check our stuff out, check out Justin's YouTube channel. He's killing it. I tell him he's going to be the functional medicine king of YouTube, and I'm trying to become a close to, <laughs> a close second behind him. Uh, I watched a, a bodybuilding video or uh, some type of uh, fitness channel on YouTube where they have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, and they this guy, kind of a real cut guy, he took everybody through his day of eating, and his lunch was – or no, his breakfast smoothie – was straight mangoes and it was i don't know some protein with like sucralose in it and then he said oh because i like to have a little crunch in my protein shake i recommend adding a half cup of reesey puffs <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> and then he so then he goes to his lunch and then he's showing uh you know he's got egg whites and turkey bacon for a kind of a brunch and then a diet coke and it's like <laughs> And this and this is recent. This is not outdated material. This is something that's come out over the last like month. This is a huge fitness channel. There's tons of them like that. And you know these these videos are getting hundreds of thousands of views, and people are doing this. And it really scares me. And it really thinks that we have to break into the YouTube model a little bit more. You and I have a lot of work to do there to really bring some more clarity because that YouTube space of health and fitness and nutrition is still stuck in 1980. Yeah, it's getting polluted. And everyone listening to this, either on iTunes or YouTube, click right below. We're going to have links for our YouTube and podcast. Subscribe. So just click right below. Do it right now. I'll take a second out and wait for you. All right, click it, hit subscribe, and then you can keep up with Evan and I and what we're doing on YouTube and the podcast. Yep. Evan, great talk today, man. It's Friday. You have an awesome weekend. You too. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Got a question for Dr. J? Go to beyondwellnessradio.com and click the questions button. Then tune in to hear the answer. Also, if you like the show, click below to review us on iTunes. For more Beyond Wellness Radio, go to beyondwellnessradio.com.